All right, so in this example, I'm gonna walk through an assignment I gave my classes on just a basic intro to R, where you just kind of try to do R stuff without me yapping. So this is an example of how I would have worked this assignment in case you get stuck. Um, so I've opened R Studio here, and I'm gonna start the assignment, uh, which you can find on Blackboard if you're in my class, or Stat Tools, oops, wrong one. Um, if you are not in one of my classes. So uh, this class is sort of interesting because it had two groups of people, people who had experience with R and people who didn't. And so the people who didn't, I had them do this half. Um, and then I had some of our previous students help. So I think that helps. <clears throat> um, so just to start look, thinking about commands and the command window, I had people try a couple of basic math commands. Please note that most of this is stolen from uh, Navarro's uh, Statistics in R book that's free online, and it's really great if you're trying to learn. So try adding more than two numbers. Well, what we're going to do is come over here to Studio, kind of put this here on the side, <clears throat> and um, this is the command window. It'll always, or the console, it'll always be down in the bottom uh, left. And this little arrow here means that it's waiting for you to do something. So if I just type one number, it tells me I have one number or uh, a vector with this is the first placeholder. Um, that's a 10. So I can add 10 plus 5, and I get 15. So fairly simple start. <clears throat> Try playing around with the number of spaces. Do those spaces matter? So now let's do 10 plus 15, or plus 5. And it doesn't appear to matter. Okay. Okay. So on many commands in R, spaces don't matter. On some commands, they do. And that's going to be the tr kind of a little bit of a tricky thing is figuring out which is which. Okay. Try hitting, hitting enter halfway through a command. Okay, So let's do 10 plus. What you'll see is you'll get this little plus down here. That doesn't mean that it's adding. It's adding because you told it to add here. And that means that it's waiting for the rest of the commands. So if I hit 5, it'll. Um, do the 15. If I did 10 minus, you'll see it still gives me a plus here. So it's saying, okay, I'm going to do the previous line plus whatever you tell me to do now, and I can get a 9. If you are typing a command with lots of open and closed parentheses, sometimes you'll forget one, and um, it will give you that little plus symbol. So if, I, if you're stuck with the plus symbol and you can't figure out why, hit escape, and escape will cancel out the command you're trying to run. <clears throat> Uh, let's do multiply 3 by 14 and subtract 5. So 3 times 14 minus 5. And what you'll see is that R understands um, the order of operations. So it will perform operations in the order specified in the like, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally kind of way, unless you specify to do it a different way. So it does understand the rules of operations. So we're going to put 5 to the power of 4. So 5, it's the little caret symbol above the 6 on normal keyboards. 5 to the 4th is 625. And then we're going to do some, copy my numbers here, divided by 1, 2, 5, 3. <clears throat> okay. And so that's just trying to get you, um, oh, I did a little transposing of the numbers there get you used to typing in the console window and kind of what happens in the output. Okay. <clears throat> Next thing is to do some logical operators. So logical operators allow you to determine if something is true or false. Um, <clears throat> and that is important because of data screening and subsetting. Okay. So we're going to ask it, does 2 plus 2 equal 5, basically? Now if you do just do 2 plus to equals five, it's gonna not be very happy with you. So a single equal sign <clears throat> is when you're trying to set something equal to it, because it's called assigning it. So it thinks that you wanna set two plus two with these weird spaces to literally to the number five. Um, the other thing that R doesn't really like, so if I squish the spaces, it's, um, <clears throat> oops, try again. It still doesn't like this because it starts with the number two. Um, 
And this is a good example of when the error messages don't make a whole lot of sense. It's just unhappy with you because variable names cannot include um, some types of characters and they can't start with numbers and they can't have spaces. Okay. So think mostly they need to be text. Um, so if you want to do like question one, you could do Q1, that sort of thing. So logical operators require double equals. And so think about it uh, as you're saying, is this equal to? So uh, this should give us a false. Then it's false because it equals four. Um, but a single operator is for assigning things, uh, single equals. Double equals is for asking if something is true. All right, so we're gonna test whether eight raised to the power of 13 is less than five to the power of 15 to nine. So I got eight raised to 13. Is that less than 15 raised to nine? And it's also false. Okay. Uh, and then if you just weren't sure, cause that's beyond my math abilities, it's that big number versus that big number. Okay, so clearly eight to the power of 13 is bigger. <clears throat> okay. um, and so that's just getting you used to playing with some stuff. Let's try some scripts now. So we're gonna do the, to -do, the toolbar to start a script here. And then we're gonna save the rest of the assignment in the script. So I'm gonna copy all this so I don't have to keep flipping back and forth. And do the script. So don't do file you can do file, new file, R script. Don't do new project there. So do it to here, file, R script. That's much easier. And then now I can paste things in here. Okay. It's not gonna like all this very much because this isn't proper code, but I can use it to um, show you what I'm doing. Okay, so I wanna do scripts. The nice thing about scripts is that if you put dollar sign, or I'm sorry, hashtags, pound symbol, number symbol, whichever one you like, in front of it, um, it thinks it's a comment. So see how it changed to green? That means it's a comment, it's gonna ignore that line. If you run a line with a um, hashtags in front of it, it just says, okay, I ran that, I don't, I'm don't. i not doing anything with it. <clears throat> now numbers are in blue right now because numbers are a special command, so they turn up in different colors. So anytime you use a word that is a reserved word in R, it will come up as a different color, like here under N. So we're gonna save this. Okay, so be sure you're saving here. So this is one, I'm gonna call it something that makes sense to me, worked to R, there we go. Um, be sure you hit save here and not up here, because saving up here saves a different thing than saving down here. All right, write comments that this is your homework. That's basically what I'm doing. Okay. Save the rest of your assignment in a script. Check. Okay. So let's try some functions. Um, functions, so the first one is use the square root function to calculate the square root of 789. So I'm gonna do SQRT, open parentheses. Everything in a parentheses is called a um, argument. So some functions require multiple arguments and some require one argument. Square root requires one. Okay, so I'm gonna do 789. If you are on a Mac, you can hit Command and Enter Return at the same time. It'll take it from up here, move it down here. So it's 28. You can also click the Run button here. It'll run the current line. If you're wanting to run multiple lines, highlight them first. If you're on a Windows machine, it's Control R or control enter. You get two of them, we only get one. Now I'm gonna use the round function. So 2.456, okay. And so that rounds it to the nearest whole number. So it took one argument there, but if I look at the next question, it says round it to two decimal places, which means I need to enter a second argument. So some commands require two arguments, so you see how when I started typing, it popped up and gave me an example of what it looks like. Um, but if you don't enter anything for an argument, it gives you a default. So the reason mine worked up here is because the round function, uh, which I had it stayed, let's try again. Um, 
if you don't type anything in the second argument, it assumes that you mean zero. So you see how it says digits equal zero? It's assuming that you want zero if you don't tell it what to do. Now I could type digits equals two for decimals, but if you will notice, arguments have an order to them. So as long as I keep it in order, it's, it doesn't matter if I type the digits part. Uh, when you're first learning, I suggest typing them out like this, uh, just so you know what you're doing. And as you get better, you can sort of realize what order they go in and ignore that part. All right, so R has this factorial function. Get this. You can see all of it on one screen. Um, and so you can't, I don't think you can do this. Let's try it. Yeah, so it doesn't like you doing that, but that's how we would write it out. So instead, it has a function called factorial. And what we'll do is put in 25. And so it gives us a really big number with a whole bunch of places. Now this is scientific notation. Um, if you don't like scientific notation, it's the options command, psi pen equals 999. And then there, now it's not in scientific notation. That's something we will, I'll remind you of off and on during out the year because people forget it pretty easily, but you can turn off scientific notation. And so that's what the question here is about. It's about the fact that it automatically does scientific notation for you. Okay, so let's see what this does. Now this really just depends on your computer, I think. Um, so some people will get this gamma fn error, and it says value out of range. Some people's errors just say inf. Inf means infinity. Basically that means it's too big for R to calculate, and that's what this warning message is too. Oh, so here's my inf. Um, the warning message basically is like, I can't handle this. All right, now that we've tried a couple little functions, let's play around with variables. So we're going to create a variable called potato, and then I'm going to set it equal to something, so equals, and I ate some sweet potatoes today, so I'm going to put one. Um, I've probably eaten a ton of potatoes, but let's just pretend. So now when I create a variable, look what happens, it pops up over here under values. So now I know that I have a variable saved. So typing in the console window is great until you need to use something again. So variables allow us to use things over and over again. And this uh, assignment has you work through a, different, a couple different types of variables. So this type of variable is called a vector with only one row or one column, either way you want to think about it, of data. Uh, not multiple rows or multiple columns. Okay. So we're going to print out that value by typing out its name, so potato. Look, and so it prints out the one here. So it doesn't print out potato equals one, it prints out what's in potato. So in this over here, the values are listed in the names of them and then what's in them is over here on the right. Okay. Try that again with the print function. I rarely use the print function because it's extra keys to type, but you can use print. So it gives you the same answer. We're gonna calculate the square root of potato, which is not a very exciting answer. So square root potato gives me one. So the purpose of this question is to really show you that uh, functions can take variable names. So the square root function we did earlier on um, the square root of 789, so we did a square root of a, a number, that makes sense, but you can also take the square root of a vector. And so it will go through each um, number one at a time and take the square root of it. If your vector is a character vector, right, where it has letters in it, it'll give you an error message. All right, next question. Print out the value of potato to verify that the value hasn't changed. So have we done anything to potato? Nope. Okay. So you see over here that it's still one. Now we're gonna make potato to potato times two. Now if you just did this, that gives you a two, but then if I tell it to print out potato, potato's still a one. So anytime you want to reassign something, you have to say potato equals potato times two. 
Okay, and that will overwrite the original value. So watch over here. As I run this, it's gonna go from one to two. Okay. So anytime you wanna save something, you have to use the equal sign. Okay. Print out potato again, just to make sure. Ta-da, now it's two. Now, I think this question is just worded poorly, so my fault. Print out a character, try making a character vari variable. We're gonna call it cheese. I didn't mean to make a string cheese joke here, but it, it did. Character variables are sometimes called strings because that's what um, is in them, is a bunch of uh, letters. And so we're going to just put string in it. Okay. Now I see because I'm typing words, I have to put quotes around it. So now I have a variable called cheese that's got string in it. Um, if I tried to do this, it's gonna be pretty unhappy because if there are no quotes around it, it assumes that it's something, oh goodness, sorry, something over here. If there are quotes around it, it assumes that you mean there's a, it's a, a set of letters. Okay. So um, use quotes, uh, and if it doesn't work, try it without the quotes. <laughs> Is Because uh, sometimes variable names need the quotes, and sometimes they don't. It's, it's difficult to explain why and when that happens, so I always just try it with and without and see which one runs. We're also supposed to make a logical variable because cheese is happiness. So you see how true changed to blue. You can also just do a T, um, but I like typing it out because then I know what I'm doing. Um, and it changed to blue because it's a reserved word. So now we have a che string cheese equals happiness. Uh, and that is true. Okay, so we have three variables and they're three different types. So cheese is a character variable. Happiness is a logical variable. Potato is a numerical variable. Now we're going to try creating one with a missing value. I just called stuff. NA is also a reserved word. So NA means missing. Null is a different thing. So stick with NAs. Okay. So now we have three or four different types of variables. Now let's try. I'm going to mute my notifications too here. Um, <clears throat> doing some vectors. Okay, so I'm gonna create a numeric vector with three elements. So I'm gonna save this as uh, numeric. Okay. Uh, one quick hint that'll save you lots of grief later down the road. As you type, functions will pop up because it's like asking, hey, do you wanna do this thing? Um, so if there's a function already called something, don't create your variable names with those same names. Uh, one day I had an extremely hard time figuring out that I shouldn't have called a variable mean because there's a function called mean and it, uh, R got very confused because it couldn't decide if I meant the variable mean or the function mean and it was uh, let's just say very uh, bitchy at me for it so uh, try not to name things the same names as functions so if it's starting to pop up and you didn't call it that uh, don't call it that so the C function is for concatenate or combine C open parentheses and I could do one two three uh, I could do one colon three that comes up later in the assignment but let's just do one two three and so now over here I have a vector look it tells me what type it is it says it's a num which is for numeric and then it says I have one two I have three values so one colon mean three means one through three and my values are one two three now, creating a character vector, same idea. So I gave it three values. See over here it says CHR, that's for character. It has three values as well. And then um, those are the three values. Oops. So, Let's try this one. We're gonna create a numeric vector called age, whose elements contain the ages of three people you know. All right, so, ooh, lowercase c. And then we're also gonna add names. So I can say Aaron equals 33, um, Rachel equals 24, and Shannon equals, I can't remember, I might be making up their ages. Um, so here's the interesting thing. I did not have to put those in quotes. So let me show you what age looks like. Okay, so it's got R3, 
ages out here. <clears throat> um, but if I did put it in quotes, I don't think it would have mattered. Okay, that's what that looks like. So it works the same either way. Um, and so that's one of those weird instances where the quotes don't matter. Don't know why, but it doesn't. <clears throat> so we're going to use the index by number. Oh yeah, sorry, this was a typo. I had changed things. This is a 29. 29 specifically, or 28, or whatever. I'm going to use 29. Okay, so use the index by number to get it to print out the first element. So I'm going to do age. Square brackets indicate what I'm pulling from it. Okay, so if you see over here, see how it has square brackets here? That's how I know I should use square brackets here. Okay. And then I'm going to pull out the first one, which is 1. If you've ever programmed before, lots of languages start with 0. R is not one of those. So age 1, and it prints out me. Use the negative indices to print out everything except the first element of that vector. Okay, so I'm gonna do H. Anytime you have a negative in front of it, it says everything but these. So that should print out the last two. Use a logical index to print out everyone whose age is greater than 20. Okay, well that's gonna print out everybody, but we'll do it anyway. So I'm gonna do H and then square brackets well, uh, first of all, the temptation is to do age and then just do greater than 20. But that's going to give you a logical vector that says true, true, true. Okay, if we did age greater than, let's do 25, that uh, would be true, false, false. That prints out everybody. That's not what I want. I wanted you to do age, square brackets, now take in your logical vector. So it says in the variable age here, give me everyone whose age is greater than, the assignment says 20. So it's going to print out all three. If you said 25, because mine are all over 20, it would just print out me. Use index by name to return the age of one of the people. So I could do age, square brackets. Now this does need to be in quotes, I think. Let's try that. So that'll print out me. I think if we try it without square quotes, it's going to be un unhappy. Okay. Uh, not square quotes. <laughs> without quotes in the square brackets. Okay. So that is how you index by number, dropping by number, logical values. So it took that true, false, false, and only returned the trues, and by, by name. Okay. And that sort of subsetting or pulling data out is going to be very useful for the rest of the semester. So try to get what's going on there. All right, now for data frames, data frames are um, basically the type of data you're going to use um, to do statistics. And <clears throat> what we really want to do is get used to using them. So if you've done anything in Excel or SPSS, data frame is that kind of data set. So if you type in air quality, you can see this giant bunch of crap. So it printed it out for you. And one rule to remember is if it printed, it didn't save. Okay, so if you see something, it often does not save. So um, if I just type age, right, it's going to print that out for me. But if I uh, do age equals, it's going to save. So um, all that did was print it out for us, which isn't super helpful. So instead, we're going to do this data air quality. Okay. Now that brings it up over here and it says promise. This is one of the most ridiculous things, but um, that essentially means that it is a data set that is part of base R or a, it's part of um, a package you have open in R. We'll get to those in a minute. And um, I think of it as I promise it's there. <coughs> but if you want to see what's in it before you start working with other commands, you can use the head command and then do air quality. The head command says give me the first six rows. So it's head, like, give me the header essentially. Now when I did that, it's like, oh right, here's what air quality is. Okay. The little drop down here will show you the columns. Um, and you'll notice how it's listed differently. So here under values, this is only where vectors and lists go. It gave me one through three. So there are three things in this. But here, because it's a, a bigger array 
or it's got rows and columns, it says there's 153 observations, that's how many rows there are, of six variables, that's how many columns there are. If you click on it here, it will actually show you what it looks like. Um, and then it'll let you sort and filter as well. Now the filter command does not actually save that idea of, um, like it doesn't, if I do this filter, it still has 153 variables. It's just visually showing me the filter. It doesn't actually save it where it's only these six. Okay. That's the next sort of steps we're about to do. I use the view command to make sure I loaded it correctly. So we're going to use the dollar sign method. So you always have to tell it first, what data set are you working with? Okay, so if I just typed wind, well, never mind that I spelled wind wrong, but um, it's like, uh, there's no wind. And you're like, but wind is right over here. I see it. It's right there. Well, that's because wind is part of air quality. So you see how it's kind of like indented here to say, you got to tell it which data set wind is in first. Okay, fine. So I'm going to tell it in. So as soon as you hit the dollar sign operator, it's like, oh, you want one of these columns? I'm like, yeah, I want that one. So there's wind. So that gives you all of the column wind in air quality. <clears throat> Print out the third element of wind. All right, so I'm going to do air quality, dollar sign, wind. I'm going to square brackets. Give me the third one. Okay, so that rule works the same. Okay, so now let's create a new data set called AQ. So AQ equals, that's only the first 10 cases of air quality. Um, sorry, I, I should have made that a little clearer on here. Um, I think people thought I meant the first 10 cases of wind. Don't do that, then the next one won't work. Okay, So the first 10 rows of air quality, essentially. So the easiest way to do that is to do air quality square brackets now. We've been using one number here because when you only have one row of data or one column of data, you just count across or down. But air quality is a multidimensional array. It's got rows and columns. So if I told it one through 10, it doesn't know if I mean one through 10, the rows or one through 10, the columns, if it were that big. So what you have to do is use a comma. Okay. And the first thing before the comma is rows. The second one is columns. So I'm going to put the one, give me one through 10 here. And then I'm going to leave everything after the comma blank to say, give me everything. Okay, so if you leave it blank, it gives you everything. So here's an example. <clears throat> if I typed air quality, whoa, not air miles. And I did nothing. It's going to give me every row and every column. Okay. <clears throat> so one through 10 here. one colon 10, not semicolon. So now you see AQ, AQ is the first 10 of air quality. So if I flip back and forth here, okay. The only thing that's happened is it's something about the word month that's changing sides. <clears throat> now, why did I do that here? Um, Cause I was using air quality, but I told it only the wind column. So when you picked out one column, there's only one more thing you need to do. You count down the columns. Okay. So essentially what's happening is I'm telling it, pick these first 10 rows and give me everything. But when I said air quality, dollar sign wind, it was just counting one, two, three. Okay. Now use a logical operator to print out where ozone is higher than 20. Okay. So I got AQ. I just want ozone. And then here, what I want to do, uh, oh, it print out all the days. So I actually want days here. Oh, no, just day. There we go. <clears throat> where ozone is higher than 20. I've only picked one column, so I don't need any commas. Oh, let's run that. Okay. It doesn't like that. Why doesn't it like that? Well, let's try quotes. Maybe that's what's not liking. Okay. And then that worked a little better for us. So it says in this, um, in this data set. But if you look at the answer it gave you, it just says one through 10. So it's still not happy with you. So what should you try? Try this. AQ 
ozone. When you told it AQ day, it completely ignores that there's anything else. It says here's one through 10. Okay, so it didn't know what to do with ozone. But now you're telling it to pull specifically the ozone ones where it's greater than 20. And that worked. So it gave me one, two, NA, six, seven. Why did it do that? Well, one and two, ozone's greater than 20. Um, it gave me this NA for row five. So if you're using the logical operator and you ask it about NAs, instead of returning a true or false, it doesn't know what to do because it's an A, so it just returns an A. So what did the output do with the NA values? It showed them to you. Now let's try the subset function. It's one of my favorite functions. So I'm going to do subset equals, uh, it's open parentheses, okay, so data set AQ, and then logical operators, ozone, greater than 20, and then you can tell it to just return days if you want. Okay. Unexpected comma. Oops, I'm sorry. Like that. Okay. And so this time it just gave me one, two, six, and seven. Okay. It ignored, you can also do it like this. And that would give you the whole row. Leave that one in there for you guys. Okay. So it ignored the NA values. Okay. So if I use the logical operators with the square brackets, they stay. If I use the subset function, they go. And that's one reason I really like the subset function um, is because if I want to know when ozone is greater than 20 and I have a, a missing value, I don't give two craps about it, right? I want it to go away. But just kind of showing you that, that you can get different output depending on which function you use. Okay, so we're going to create a new variable. So we're going to create a new variable inside AQ. So I'm going to do have to tell it go in data set AQ. And we're going to make one up. So you can make them up as you go. And it's a logical variable that's true if wind, typo there, is greater than 10. So I'm going to say, okay, I want everything in AQ, the wind column, that's greater than 10. Okay. And so AQ Wendy, let's look at it. So let's see if that worked. So wind 7.4, it's false. 8.0, false. So that seems to have worked. True. Okay. Now we're going to delete that variable. Okay. I said that null was a special operator. You want to delete something, set it to null. And then now, Wendy went away. Or to Wendy went away. Okay. Alright, so the next piece is about packages. So it's essentially like, install a bunch of packages that I know you will need throughout the semester. Okay. And the easiest way to do that is to click over here. I'm just going to do car... Um, the rules are the same for all of these, um, but if ggplot takes forever to load, so I'm just going to click and do one. So you click packages, you click install, and as you start typing, it should pull up the options that match. So if you try to, if you misspell it or you, uh, case does matter, it will basically say, I don't know what you want. So star, uh, car, hit install. going to do something. There it goes. Uh, if you install a package you already have, it just uh, overwrites it. So it doesn't hurt you. Right. So essentially the code for this, if you don't want to click the buttons a bunch of times, is install.packages and then it's the name of the package. That comes in handy if you're working on, let's say, a school computer that does not have all this stuff pre-installed, like your own personal computer. Um, and you can just tell it to include that code so every time you run it on a computer, you know you'll have the packages you need. Loading a package is the library command because heaven forbid it be consistent and it does not need the quotes. So I can load the car library. 
Um, it's being grumpy with me because this is the newest version of car and I have not updated my R, but that's okay. The other thing you can do is click on the little uh, checkbox over here under packages. I don't love doing it over here sometimes because um, sometimes it doesn't stick. And last but not least, importing a CSV file. Um, the easiest way to do this is to click import data set up here in the environment window from text file. The CSV files are comma delimited. So that means that they are, um, you can open them in Excel and it'll look like Excel, but the, the way they're actually structured is like uh, data point, comma, data point, comma, data point. Okay. Let me find my file I put online here. Okay. I called it a little something else. Um, I called it something wrong, but whatever. So you hit, uh, after you find the file, click OK. It will show you what it looks like. Here's the biggest thing. You can rename it here fairly easily. So you see how it auto converted to having dots because it doesn't like spaces, but do not start a variable with a number. You will regret your life choices. Okay, so I'm just gonna call this example data because that's the name of the file you guys have. Here's the other thing. If you get this v1, v2, v3, it's gonna import this whole thing as characters because the second row is characters. So under heading, click yes. And that will move up the header row that's got your variable names um, into variables. So here where it's bolded, that means it's taking it as a variable name. Most of the rest of this, you're gonna leave alone. Um, if you don't have a header row, clearly leave it as no. Click import. That'll import my example data set and show me um, examples. Um, and show me what it, it looks like. And then over here, I can see what columns I have in it. Okay. So it imported as an integer, a factor variable, because it had uh, strings in it. We'll cover factor variables a little more later. And a logi or logical variable for having true falses. And then I can copy this code and paste it in here. So I'm gonna change the name of this. There we go. Um, and so that is how it imported the code. Okay, so there's a little bit on working directories in this um, in the notes, and we'll cover those more later. But if you didn't want this giant path, you could change your working directory um, and exclude all that. But we'll cover that more later. Okay. So that is how you work just some basic R um, commands, uh, including importing files, packages, and scripts.